you started Cap Desk now. So how did you get to that? Like, tell me about your other ventures and how you got to here. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thanks for having me as well, Milan. Um, so I mean, high school played a lot of tennis, I think, and then got a back injury, and then I came came back home. My dad's a graphic designer, and you know, I just didn't really know what to do like after school, to be honest, in all honesty, because you know, most people like the people who just hang out after school just got so bored of it. So my dad was a graphic designer, so he said like, hey, you can do some graphic design work for me. And then I earned like, I don't know, 15 pounds an hour or something like that for just doing some some, some of the clients my dad had. Uh, and then when I went to in high school, I was like, well, what should I do? I'm not sure. So um, I got an internship in San Francisco. And when I went to San Francisco, it was sort of like, people were just batshit crazy, <laughs> but like in a good way, right? So I came from like Denmark, that's where I grew up. I also lived a little bit in Australia. And I felt like a little bit different, like a, a little bit more adventurous than I guess my peers. And when I came to San Francisco, it was just gone ho. You know, it's like cowboy land. It was in 2010-ish, 11. And I was young. I came there. I was like, I was like 19, 20 or something. And uh, at one point, I didn't know any people. So I went to a party and I could like code a little bit and do a little bit of graphic design. And this party, I just got really drunk. And uh, I woke up the next day and I had apparently promised to design a website and logo for God knows how many startups. And some lady just picked me up in her in her fancy car, and we just drove around all day with hangovers to make stuff. And that's how I came like into this like entrepreneurship network. And I was like, oh shit, there's people everywhere with like crazy ideas. I call them like believers. Like when you meet just people with ideas who wanna like be in a low wage just to do it. I mean, it's awesome. So I just connected the instantly with that. Got part of a startup. After six months, my visa expired. Went back to Denmark. And I was sitting in Denmark there, which is a very small town. If you think London is more like Copenhagen, it's even smaller. And everybody was speaking Danish. You know, there wasn't any expats and there wasn't even an event. Nobody was speaking about like entrepreneurship and startups. And that's what I just loved. Like that was my new passion. That's what I loved. So I wanted to study computer science. But before doing that, I just started to like create an incubator. Um, what that incubator was about was just finding crazy ass ideas in in, in Copenhagen, just crazy ideas. Like people want to make like shoes, people who want to make like a computer game, just everything. And then I rented a theater and I got like uh, the previous, I, I partnered up with the previous ambassador to Canada, much older than me, because I was like 21. Um, and uh, then we just started broadcasting these ideas in this theater. So imagine like 400 people sitting in the crowd, like 200, 400 people sitting in the crowd who all like loved like this idea of pitching. And then we also broadcasted it to this ambassador's uh, network all over the world. And in all fairness, I lost an awful lot of money on it because I was just using my, my savings just to rent this theater. There wasn't any business plan at all. Then one month before I was supposed to study uh, computer science, I got a call from these Swedish guys, like Christian. Um, we want to like acquire your business and hire you as investment, plat uh, investment director for this platform. I was like, what? I'm like, yeah, you're doing crowdfunding. I was like, okay, am I doing crowdfunding? Yeah, yeah, you're crowdfunding ideas. I was like, well, what do you, what, what, what do you pay me? And they're like, okay, here's the contract. You know, it looked good. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to study computer science tonight. And then I'm going to start this uh, crowdfunding platform for equity um, called Funded by Me. So it's like Crowdcube or Cedars for those of you who know those platforms, but in Scandinavia. And at that time, it was just when this equity crowdfunding was coming on board. So I thought it would be pretty cool to run an investment platform. They gave me office, a fancy title, and uh, and three employees, or something like that. And then off I went uh, into the world of finance. And then I, one month later, started studying computer science. And when I was working for the investment platforms, that's when I spotted like all the problems there was with finance. I was just, oh my God, there's so many problems here to be fixed. And being quite like visual and, um, I don't know, I guess a little bit against the stream, I just started plug, uh, coming up with ideas of how we could fix it. And then before I finished my undergrad, I met a business angel who offered me some money to build what is now Capdesk, which is a platform to take equity off spreadsheets and put it on the internet. So think, don't think radio on internet, think equity on internet, EOI, equity on internet. Whenever you buy shares in a private company, um, in the future, you log into a platform called Capdesk and you'll also be able to sell it on Capdesk. So think Robinhood uh, or free trade, but um, Capdesk. Companies. I mean, I use eToro and stuff like that. So there's a lot of 
um, retail, stuff like that. But that's awesome. So, I mean, for Capdesk, uh, the sort of tagline or something is manage all your equity on a single online platform from C to exit, which I love. So how did it get started? Like, what's the sort of story behind it? Yeah, so, I mean, I was just, um, so after the investment platform, I did a consultancy called Hard Reacher um, to go with my first employee called Casper. And we were just having like, we were like, well, we were like 23 years in the year, 23, 24. And we had our own, you know, office. And this time I didn't have a bus, right? Because I had just started my own consultancy. So we were just contracting the investment platform and other investment platforms. And that year was just like, it was a crazy year. We just did everything we could just to pay the rent. So I just did all sorts of, and I think for everybody interested in entrepreneurship, it's about like, you know how when you run, you've got runner's high, like you just run and you just like, everything just feels so good and so fun. I think way too many people strive to like become, like for the end goal to become a millionaire or to like be seen in a Fortune tech crunch with this awesome tech idea. I think, you know, just finding a person just having an extreme amount of fun where it feels more fun to stay at the office to do shit rather than to, you know, you know, go to the pub. Uh, and and trust like, and you can have drinks and office too, right? And then when you find that kind of playground, I think that's when you just that's when you become into the zone, but create that format first. So we had this like small office, but it was overlooking like the opera in Copenhagen, right next to the Queens. It was a very posh place in Copenhagen. It was overlooking like the Queen's Palace, it was overlooking like the water, and um, you know, we were like 23, 24 ish, and we just did all sorts of things just to pay the rent. It was quite, quite too expensive. So we helped like we had like St. Pauli, uh, which is like this hipster football club and this working class uh, football club in Denmark. We crowdfunded that match. We worked with like some Icelandic people uh, who wanted to to get a whale tracker funded by Google. We were we did education programs. So while I was studying myself, I sold education problem uh, courses to other universities about crowdfunding just to cover the rent. And then we also had like all sorts of ideas. I had one idea which is like like um, a charity project I wanted to get funded. I had a second idea, which is like a, a wristband called Ramio, where you could, it could measure the UV exposure you got. And uh, I had a third idea, which was CapDesk, which was, you know, a platform where you could issue equity online. And then we were just like, in this consultancy, we were just throwing out all these ideas and going to meetings all the time, you know, inviting people to the office. It was just, yeah, it just felt like a free space. Um, yeah, completely free and like everything we did just because it was fun. And then I could code like a little bit. So I just started because I wanted to test out this um this this framework, front end framework called Foundation SERP, I think it was called. So then I just started like making an extra prototype of Capdesk. And then my co founder, um his he was finished his his master's and his ex um master supervisor was a business angel who knew about private markets and uh when he saw the prototype that we've done, he was like, I want to invest. And then that was the first guy ever who said they wanted to invest in something. And then I was like, well, if you want to invest, we're going to do it. <laughs> and then we did it. And then you gradually just become, yeah, prisoner of your own idea and you get stuck. And then it's just about pure resilience from there to get it to work. Yeah. It's like a really nice place as well, so probably worth it. But um, so you've raised like what around eight million pounds? Yeah, I think like eight ten million pounds ish. So that's... what's the process like? Like a lot of listeners have started their own companies or their students who are trying to raise funding and accelerate and stuff. What's the process like, and what's the sort of challenges that you have to go through? I mean, the biggest challenge you have is that you have to. Um... So the thing is, right? I I feel perhaps also coming. You know, I started my company very young and I didn't go to any fancy, you know, I didn't own an Oxbridge graduate either or stuff like that. So it just means that it's when you see these rounds on LinkedIn with, you know, this management consultant raising like a 1 million pound seed round or these Oxbridge guys, I'm not saying that, you know, that if you go to one university, you get more funding, but I'm also implying that a little bit, like you're in some circles, which means that you have got more access to high net worth and major people and you're less risky. So I think, first of all, you're just going to, Say to yourself, um, how do I, how do I get started, and what do I want to achieve with this? Do I need funding at all? If you want to run a restaurant, you might not want to run a business business angel because how would the business angel get money, right? So how does the business get money out? You might want to maybe do a loan instead to get to pay back the loan. 
So first of all, figure out that does your idea actually need funding? Uh, once you take funding, it never ends. It never, never ends because once you sell equity, the idea of equity is you selling just like think about um, you know Etoro, as you mentioned yourself, uh, yourself, Robinhood or Free Trade. When you buy a share in Amazon, you want that share price to increase, right? But that share pri price only increases when other people buy the share. It's the same with private markets. The share price only increases when other people buy the share. So you keep on making funding rounds to increase the share price. So first of all, figure out what's the right type of funding for me. If it's equity, if you need to raise this, like it, it needs to be something that can where you can increase the share price uh, rather quickly. So this is the first point. Some people will say like get a valuation that's really high. I don't think I think if you're a young guy starting out, like do it low because you want to basically take in some. Here's the real you need to solve. You need to uh, raise enough money to give you a milestone to hit a milestone within a certain amount of month um, that you have money to to reach a three x valuation you have now. I think that's the rule. So that's just the riddle you have to solve. So you're like, okay, if I raise I don't know, 20k, that will give me six months. Um, so I raised 10k, 15k in my seed round, right? Um, and I and I had enough money for like eight months because I didn't pay my salary. I just used some other base costs. So let's just say 20k will last me six months in order to hit after three months. Here's the thing: after three months, you need to hit a metric, some metrics that um, that justifies you fundraising three months later because it's going to take three months to close the funding round to justify a three x valuation. So that's the really you want to solve. So if your valuation becomes too high, let's just say you have like a one million pound valuation, then you can never free x that within three months. But if it's supposedly low, then it's like, okay, fine, you know, I'm going to take 20k in now, but in three months time, uh, I would have gotten these three customers on board or done this or uh, have a letter of intent or something or got done the product out. I absolutely smack through the three months. And then after three months, I go to an investor, preferably be the first investor and say, I just basically 3x or 4x everything, but you can get it at a discount. So if you give me 3x valuation, I would like that to have 50k. What happens with 50k? You do the same thing again. It might be half a year runway again. It might be ideally you want a one one year runway because you can see that if you have to have a buffer of three to six months to fundraise, then you won't be doing anything else. So you want to have like a year to 18 months. I would say that's the ideal. But then you have to sacrifice your salary to get there. But anyway, let's just say the example here is you raise 20k, you tripled it. Now you raise 50k for six months again. Well, that 50k needs to triple the valuation again, right? And then you keep on basically doubling and tripling your valuation at all times. And uh, that's the that's the the upside of equity and the downside of equity. The upside of equity is you can raise that money, so you can go from raising 20k to 50k quite quickly. But the downside is that you're in this eternal loop where you always like I'm six years into CapDesk. Um, I started CapDesk when I was 24, uh, 25. I would never th think that I'll be 31 still in it. Uh, so raising more money, but that's because you're a victim of your own success. You keep on going. You never stop, right? It is a danger in having too high of a valuation too soon. So, like, what happened? Because I mean, I was reading this thing. I can't remember exactly, but it was some person a couple of years ago who had a hugely high valuation for like some fashion online startup, um, yeah. and it literally messed her completely over, and she like. Had to declare bank bankruptcy and stuff. So how does that happen? Like, surely if you have a higher number, it's everyone's sort of happier. <laughs> yeah, but think about this, right? So let's just say that you want to you want to launch I don't know uh, a fashion a e commerce a fashion e commerce site, right? And you say, well, I'm going to get a one mil a two million pound valuation, and you raise uh, a mil uh, let's just say five million pound valuation. So you valued five million pounds, you raised one million pounds, right? So actually, when you raise one million pounds on top of the five, that means you're six million pounds worth because you get one million on top of that. That's what we call the pre-money valuation and post-money valuation. Post-money is just an investment amount on top of what you were worth because now you're worth more, right? So six million worth. And then you uh, you launch a shop, everything goes well, and then all of a sudden the numbers just stagnate, right? It just stagnates. How are you going to justify a funding round which is higher than six million pounds? So now you're out saying, well, we only make 10K of revenue a year, but I need to raise in a 7 million pound funding round or 8 million pound funding round. 
and investors can be just like, like saying like what what, the, what what planet are you living on like why if you only make 20k and you don't even grow like why would you be worth eight million pounds uh so they'll probably say like you're probably close i'll probably want to like pay one million like one million pounds i think is it's, it's the average and then the previous investors will say what the hell are you doing are you doing a down like i paid for six million uh, five five million pound valuation and now you're giving away the company uh, at a one million pound valuation so they might be say no we're not going to support this you have to you have to get a better investor in because we're not getting that getting that looted at a cheaper price and then you can't raise money and then you go bankrupt but it can also be something called convertible note where you're taking debt that converts at a future funding round and um, if that funding round is it's a down round so it's much lower round than you expected then that debt converts to a share price which is very very low and then you end up giving away half the company to somebody and then yeah the rest is sort of for conclusion thing that i see on dragon's den quite a lot i don't know if you watch it but um mm-hmm. they always come on there and pitch some idea yeah. and they like raise another round at like half the valuation and they ask them for something and then they say well you know we're paying like double or triple the price that you just um got funding for like six months earlier so it's really quite funny to see that but um it's cool to know that there is so there is like a ceiling i mean there you know if you go in too high and you don't grow then you've kind of shot yourself in the foot um yeah yeah so let's go back a little bit um you've done a lot of other stuff besides uh, uh cap deck obviously that's where you are now but um crowd 15 what is what is that all about it looks pretty cool as well well so i mean when i was having this crazy time after yeah. like so even though i was working as like uh, the country manager for funded by me which is the investment platform right so the story was, you know, I was a graphic designer, did all sorts of weird stuff through the graphic design company. I launched um, I launched Creative Copenhagen Ideas by You, which is my incubator. Incubator got sold slash, like, it got merged with uh, Funded by Me, which is an investment platform, quite similar to CrowdQ Procedures. And when I was working at the investment platform, I just did all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, then I wanted to start Hard Feature, which was my consultancy. And through Hard Feature, where we did all this sort of weird stuff, I also got involved in two associations. I got I, I supported the Danish Crowdfunding Association, which is an association to help people uh, launch crowdfunding better, uh, crowdfunding campaigns, such as Kickstarter, Indiegogo, but also obviously funded by me where I worked. And then I also got involved in something called um, the Crowdsorting Association, where we help like big corporates uh, like Lego and stuff, like help crowdsource. So how can they get their, um, their crowd involved to support uh, product innovation so uh, so that was quite cool and uh, we decided to make a conference which we called crowd 15 because it was in 2015 where we basically got um, funding from the danish business authorities and then we uh, all of us we were like six people arranging it um, we arranged like a crowd conference where we talked about crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and it was uh yeah it was it's a lot of fun because uh, like doing a conference is quite intense because there's so many stakeholders involved it's almost like a mini startup. Um, mini stakeholders involved in that. And as I say, that I think all of us were so exhausted after the conference. We're like, it was over two days as well, two three days, two three days, uh, three days actually. So it's just like, oh whatever, this is just too much work. Uh, yeah, so that's that. That's that. London's sort of opening up a bit now, isn't it? Which is really nice. Yeah. Um, I think lockdown's ending on July nineteenth. <sighs> So, yeah, we've been going for like almost half an hour. Um, have you got time for another couple of questions? Yeah, go for it. Man. All right, cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, something that I always ask is what kind of advice do you have for a startup or a student startup or someone who's just getting into their first venture now? Maybe they're in university or they've just graduated into this very strange time. Like what's a general sort of piece of advice you could give them? Yeah, I think it's going to be a people advice. I think people advice is something most people take for granted. Um, so a couple of people think, like first one, don't take yourself too serious. If you meet somebody who thinks that they're the king of the world and oh, I'm good at finance and it's a little bit arrogant, like just get rid of them. Like seriously, you've got the whole, you've got to conquer so many things. You need to be together with somebody who has got, if your ego, if the ego is too big, like if it's somebody who's driven by, because he scores high academic grades and he sees it, you know, and his family and his friends see him as like, you are the, like, it can be very toxic when you're a teenager 
in terms of like putting a persona on yourself. And I see that persona over and over again, kind of the uh, like the top grade student who thinks he's a little bit better than everybody else. And then he becomes a little bit too arrogant when he moves in. But what you need to do is you need to put yourself through a war and you need to react all the time. And if you're together with somebody that thinks he's a little bit better or think he knows it all already, like that's just going to be exhausting. So find somebody that has got resilience and are open-minded and can and can hustle, like because the other ones are gonna drown you. And I think with that, with that people advice, I think when you're a teenager, right, uh, like when you go through school and stuff like that, you tend to like a startup tends to be you're with a friend, that friend, you have some beers, you talk a little bit, and then you're like, let's make a startup, right? But it's completely fine because then friendship first and then startup second. I think there's two two sides to the stick, right? I also think there's another one, which is like take some per take some person who's like, you know, uh, like semi autistic guy you you never really spoke to, but it's really brilliant. You don't really get along with that one with them, and, and then start a start with them, and then you'll figure out you could build a friendship another way of the stick. Like there's two sides to the stick. So go out and find people that can really, really, really compliment you, because that doesn't mean you'll have a great time to begin with. You don't go out and socialize and drink beer and, you know, <laughs> go hunt girls together with, you know, the more like introvert, you know, more like a, a careful guy. Or if you're an introvert guy, you don't go to the extremely, uh, you know, like extrovert guy and do it. Uh, so you end up with two personality types who think exactly the same, who now has got all of this package together and now wants to launch a startup. And it never works out. Go out and literally just look for hidden talent. Go out and find like in crazy talent and then harvest it. Like go to that guy and was like, oh my God, you're so amazing at math- mathematics. Have you ever uh, like learned how to code? But go to that guy and then harvest it, build that relationship up. Because in all truth, successful startups are the ones who get the, the, hit, the good talent. Uh, and if you start looking at people like that and how you can use them and genuinely be a good guy to them and say like, don't worry. I just want you to do a little bit of sketches here. I just want you to do that. And then if it's not uncomfortable, you can always go out. You know, I'm going to pay you for it. So start utilizing talent around you rather than just seeing your friends. I think that's the best advice I can give you. It's probably the most important thing. I mean, at least like top two or three. I mean, the people who work at your company are the company. And companies have literally gone bust because of their, their employees not like wanting to adapt or change to the industry and stuff like that. So people are the most important thing. Exactly. And and that's why I'm saying like, sometimes it's just the wrong people you think about because your knowledge set, you don't know what you don't know. Right. So you just think, let me get like the most intelligent guy and the people who think is most intelligent. If I get him on the team and it's gone. And then actually, you know, academic intelligence or intelligence in what you need to do as an associate or analyst, it's just apples and pears to the intelligence you need to have as a CEO or a manager, like you might be a great, 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 great analyst at a bank, but you should never run a company, right? But when you're in your start 20s, early, late teens, you, your friends are the ones. So, so start looking for, for other qualities because society is telling you that the miracle, you know, very like, like sort of repetitive analytical tasks is very hard and therefore you should get them on board. Start experimenting a little bit around and look at other stuff like who's great at selling? Let's get that, like, rather get a sales guy in. But don't end up in that elitist thing where you look for your, you try to scale up something from your teenage years into the future because that's going to hurt. Awesome, Christian. That's really, really good advice. Thank you. Um, Can we do like a couple of quick fire round questions? Very cheesy. I I apologize. Um, Do you have like a favorite movie or series or something that you're watching? Oh, what's my favorite movie? I like The Office. I think The Office is great. (laughs) I love the Definitely office. Love I'm, I'm the biggest fan. I, I watch like two, at least two episodes a day. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the office up. is hilarious. <laughs> it's one of the funniest yeah. shows ever. Um, what career did you dream of as a kid? Did you always see yourself as an entrepreneur or a designer, or you weren't quite sure? I didn't know. I, I I just felt like that none of the careers I got served. I didn't have any feeling about it. I was always like, oh, I wish I could speak to future me because I've got no clue at all. So uh, it's probably a good thing.